I'm Michael Bream, I'm with EV West and we build high performance electric drivetrains. EV West started back in 2010 when we set out to build a custom build uh, M3 for the Pikes Peak Hill Climb. So back in 2010, we wanted to build a race car to actually compete. At the time, me and some friends were doing some endurance racing in BMWs. We wanted something a little bit more challenging. So we said, you know, hey, let's build an electric car. Uh, we built a car for a now defunct series called the EV Cup. And actually during our build, the series went bankrupt. And so we were left with an electric car and no race to enter. Uh, we looked around and we said, hey, let's center America's race, uh, the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb. It's the second oldest race in America. It's coming up on their 100th anniversary. And we figured that was a, a pretty good challenge. It was an all uphill race. Uh, times usually averaged around 12 minutes. So it's perfect for an electric car. We didn't have to worry about charging the pack during the race. Uh, we built the car. We took the car up to Pikes Peak and we actually ran a really respectable time. Our first time out as an amateur race team uh, we ended up beating uh, every car in the vintage class uh, our first time up the hill. So we were uh, really surprised by that. The car surprised us. You know, this is a class full of guys that have been running the race for 10 and 15 years. And it's, uh, you know, Porsches and Mustangs, Cobras, Cudas, uh, all kinds of nice cars. And it was at that point that we realized, like, we're really on to something here. We were, you know, it was the first race car build that we've done with an electric drive train. And we went out and we had uh, great success with the car and all it did is uh, get us really energized to kind of look at other projects and see what, what can we do with electric drivetrains. The greatest thing about this is, is it's all about the cars. You know, we're not pushing our agenda on anyone. It's not about, this has to be electrified. It's all about the cars. And, and we grew up as car guys and we just absolutely love cars. And why not look at new avenues of improving things uh, that you love? And, we tell people all the time, it's, it's not about electrifying the car, it's about making the car better. And if somebody invented a system to make a car faster and run longer on dog farts, I'd probably become a dog fart engine installer. Uh, we just, you know, we want to make the cars better. And that's really what it's all about. You know, it's, it's, it's all about the cars, it's all about preserving the cars. We go through great lengths not to alter the cars, not to cut them up or change them. Uh, we have probably the most difficult car that we've done is we currently have a Ferrari 308 in the shop and it has a transverse mounted transmission in it and it's uh, actually cast into the engine block so we had to remove the whole entire transmission and put a G50 transaxle in there from a Porsche Turbo uh, and just basically start the ground up with shift linkage and uh, motor mounts and axles and everything like that so it's, it's not every day that you have to do that to a car and then uh, to make it more difficult on ourselves, we're actually putting three electric motors in it to give it the power that it deserves. Because we kind of have this little motto here. Um, if we touch a car, we have to make the car faster no matter what. And we set a little goal for ourselves to at least double the horsepower of a car. Like if you can't go into this and electrify a car and at least double the horsepower or triple the torque, uh, it's almost not worth doing what we're doing. You know, it's expensive and it's complex, so you better have results if you're just going to come out of it with the same amount of horsepower, but you think you're uh, better because you've electrified it and you've kind of missed the point of uh, converting a car. So the general concerns are just basically a lot of the information that customers don't know about, you know, uh, how far can I drive it? How long is it going to take to recharge it? Uh, how much is this going to increase my electric bill? There's just a lot of misconceptions of uh, mainly um, it's, it's just really like the units of measurement. You know, a lot of guys in motorsports are really intelligent guys, are super smart, uh, but they're just not real comfortable with speaking about, you know, kilowatt uh, output and kilowatt hours of capacity. Uh, and it, it kind of gets dicey on some of the definitions. But once people kind of wrap their head around uh, the definitions and how to kind of equate them, how to equate kilowatt into horsepower, uh, they tend to become real comfortable with it and it becomes second nature. You know, there was some concerns out there early on about electric cars and, and a lot of people just tend to be scared of the unknown. There was some talk about some fires. I think uh, one or two Teslas that were slammed into a wall at over 100 miles an hour caught on fire. And, you know, you, you got to kind of just back up and look at statistics. And statistically, you're more than 10 times safer uh, from fire and any other dangers in an electric car. You don't have a liquid fuel, you have something kind of contained. And in all those uh, instances of early fires, you know, nothing was explosive, it was slow, smoldering, they were safely pulled over, uh, things like that. So um, I think with time, you're gonna see a lot of more information coming out in these instances and, and more and more guys are gonna embrace this a little bit more. 
You know, one of the other uh, things that we get asked about is, you know, forward compatibility. A lot of people get into these systems kind of like they're, you know, a computer and then some new video card comes out and it's not compatible. And really electricity is electricity. And uh, again, the battery packs the Achilles heel. So down the line, you could take a system that you might put a lot of money into the drivetrain, maybe the motor and the controller, and you can add a battery pack. You know, people often ask us, how long does the battery last? And we tell them, you know, you'll probably get 10 to 15 years out of the battery pack. But don't worry, because 10 to 15 years down the road, you're going to have a battery that's lighter, it's more powerful, it's going to have more capacity and range, and it's going to cost less, like all technologies. So the upgrade prospects look good down the road, because eventually, you know, at the end of the day, you're just putting voltage into the motor. And that uh, uh, process of capturing that voltage, storing it in the car, um, is just improving, I mean, every month. So admittedly, the biggest limitation is the range and the amount of energy that you can fit in the battery packs. You know, electrons are really lightweight, so really we're dealing with a problem here of the container that we're keeping the electrons in, and that's advancing every year. Uh, right now we're around 150 watt hours per kilogram of energy density. When we started this, we were much lower than that, we were below 100. And now there's some chemistries going on in the labs and some schools that are up near the 500 watt hour per kilogram mark. And it's just gonna continue to get more and more energy dense. Cause right now we can take the energy out of the battery pack so much quicker than we can put it in. So for any type of motorsport event or anything like that, there's really no way to charge the car during the race. You pretty much have to start with pre-charged batteries. And that's why you see in Formula, One, uh, Formula E racing nowadays, they're actually switching cars halfway through the race because they can't charge the car during the race quick enough. It's a real exciting time with the batteries. There's several different technologies that are kind of competing and each of the major manufacturers are kind of getting behind a company or partnering up. Uh, we see this with Tesla and their Giga factory and we see some of the uh, arrangements like with LG and some of the major uh, automotive makers. Within the types of batteries, you have some companies that are using large format batteries like what you would see in a Nissan Leaf or a Chevy Bolt. And you have some companies using the smaller format batteries in bigger numbers such as Tesla and the Model S. There's advantages to both of them, but right now it seems like the uh, small format, uh, higher numbers seems to be winning out. So one of the big advantages of the electric drivetrain is its overall efficiency. You look at the cars uh, and how many watt hours of energy that they use per mile, and uh, it's the most efficient way to actually propel a vehicle down the road. So we look at, uh, try and compare those numbers to gas, and it gets a little bit muddy in the middle because there's so much energy spent pumping and refining gas. Some estimates put it as high as 14 kilowatt hours of energy just for one gallon of gas. If you look at something like a Model S with an 85 kilowatt hour capacity, uh, you know, you could only pump maybe six gallons of gas into a regular car and you've already charged up your Tesla and you can drive it up to 300 miles. So some of the math doesn't work out and there's definitely other interests that kind of want to lead you to believe otherwise with the math. But uh, right now, just about any uh, trained engineer will tell you the most efficient way to drive a car is basically on electric power. And, and again, we're not trying to take anything away from gas. We all drive gas cars, we drive race cars, we have fun in them. Um, but uh, this is just another avenue to propel a car and we really do it just for the instant torque, the low end power that these cars have and the reliability of the drivetrain. So it's a real exciting time in electric motorsports. You know, we got a lot of events uh, being more open to electric entries. You know, we talked about Pikes Peak earlier. We also have Formula E. Super exciting time, you know, especially if you're into motorsports. There's so many things in motorsports that are just so um, spec and, and so governed. And we have that in the first couple of years of Formula E. The season's been great and they're all running the same chassis, the same motor. Next year, we're gonna see the series open up to motor, inverter, and gearbox changes. So you're gonna see some teams come in and really play with some newer technologies. You're gonna see some advancements. Some, maybe some of the guys a little bit more money getting ahead. And then year three of Formula E starting in 2017, uh, we're gonna see uh, basically O open, you know, open class. So you're going to see a lot of uh, experimentation and, and you don't even have that in Formula One right now. You know, everything's pretty well governed in Formula One. So it's real exciting to look down the line to see what's coming with Formula E, to see open class racing. Uh, there's not very many disciplines of motorsport that allow open class racing. So you got to be excited for that anyways. You know, I have so much respect for any anybody who's engineering in motorsports, you know, because they're they're just constantly pushing the envelope and you can tell a true engineer they're not happy unless they're pushing it you know and, and we kind of feel the same way we're just 
we're not happy. Uh, in fact, we tell people all the time we don't do production work. You know, after we do one or two examples of a particular motor in a particular car, um, we we won't do that anymore. We won't accept that kind of work, or we won't accept that vehicle. We're just constantly looking for that next challenge. So you know, I encourage anyone in automotive design, automotive engineering, um, check out electric drivetrains. You know, it's it's uh, it, it seems a little daunting at first, but I think once you get into it, once you understand uh, the unit's measurement and, and uh, the basic uh, outlines of the system that we put together, you'll you'll probably find it pretty enjoyable. You know, there's a lot of neat things in there, and, and uh, it has a lot to offer. Like, Sometimes uh, when the phone rings, you just never even know, like, what's that next project going to be? What's the next um, uh, goal? And it, you just, there's no way to guess. There's just no way to guess at all. It, it, uh, it could be something beyond your wildest dreams, you never even know it.